All right, um, so I will talk uh, today a little bit about uh, the discipline I'm working in as an acoustic ecologist uh, at one hand. At the other, I will show some examples how projects constitute or how, how normally projects start. Um, one thing that is really important for me when I start to work on uh, environmental topics is that I work with two perspectives at the same moment. That means, uh, at one hand, I'm working as a scientist on a special phenomena or, or topic or, or issue, and I try to uh, work with aesthetical means or investigate the same object by aesthetical uh, by an aesthetical perspective. Um, from the beginning. But uh, what I won't tell now, but tomorrow, is how, what we exactly do at the Oclot Total. So that's really just a teaser now. And um, I hope you will be present also tomorrow when I'm here with Daniel Buchli and we talk much more in detail about what we have done so far at Oclot Total and will do in the future. And of course, there will be the walk this afternoon to uh, the installations down at Okla Tobel. Um, I will see if I will, can be part of that because actually we have to go and uh, maintain the recorders. But let's see how the program develops. All right. So uh, what you see here is uh, one of my working places. It's, uh, it's not here in uh, Graubünden, but in Walle. It's the main valley, uh, the Ronetal. You see the Rhone River and parts of Peenwald, maybe some Swiss, Swiss participants here know that, maybe from uh, the new series called Chukker, which mainly happens in that forest. Um, it's mainly playing in that forest. Uh, I worked there since uh, 2009 already. That means it's crazy, crazy long time, 13 years already I'm working there. Uh, with different projects, I will give you some insights also in these projects, uh, also because a bigger part of what I do in my work is happening in the Swiss Alps. So uh, quite a lot of my research projects as well as artistic projects happen in Alpine ecosystems. So that's one of uh, the Alpine areas. It's uh, in the Southwest of Switzerland. It's a pretty special area because uh, it's one of the driest regions of, of the Alps in general. That means because at both sides of these valleys, that's something you won't see here in the, on that image, but on both sides of that valley, the mountains are really high. They're up to 4,000 meters. That means the weather does not all often come over the mountains. So back to the valley. So uh, we call that the mass elevation effect that causes uh, a quite uh, dry and hot climate in uh, in Valle. And uh, if you look at this forest, the Fienwald, there it's a natural reserve. It's even also a nature park as uh, 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 Nature Park Beverin is here. So it's the same structure uh, they try to maintain uh, in this particular area of Valle. But the big difference to the forest here is that the forest there shows already um, quite um, huge effects of climate change. That means parts of the forests are already dying back. It's getting too, too dry, especially for the main tree species that you find there is the Scots pine, it's a pine tree that just reached its uh, physiological limit uh, concerning drought periods. That's also the reason why WSL, the Swiss Federal Institute for Snow Landscape and Forest Research, or maybe different, um, <laughs> maybe different spelling uh, in, the, in what comes of the what uh, is there and running since uh, almost 20 years of research station in the forest. And what they do is something very strange. They irrigate parts of the forest. But that's, yeah, it's not the idea to um, try out if we could in future in drought periods irrigate forests. The idea is that after a certain time, the irrigation is stopped and they see how the forest adapts to drought, to immediate drought. So that means you have something like a speeded up process to see how the forest reacts on increasing drought periods. So that's also quite um, a link to some projects, to the projects I do there. So the projects I have done so far in Valais mainly deal with effects of climate change on uh, the vegetation in this particular area. 
But uh, yeah, back to sound or starting with sound. If you would stand there, you would hear following sounds. So of course you hear the river, the Rhone River, you hear some birds and uh, a soundscape that in this particular moment has not so much elements, uh, but of course a characteristic um, uh, keynote sound, which is formed by the river, the noise of the river. So, um, and here we enter the discipline of acoustic ecology and in general, um, I was too fast. What is interesting for me as an acoustic ecologist is to investigate what I hear acoustically in a landscape and interpret these sounds uh, in ecological ways. So I try to investigate ecological relations that are hearable in a particular landscape or as we call it, soundscape. So a landscape that sounds for us is a soundscape. And you see all the possible influences here uh, on a particular soundscape. So you hear maybe something about the vegetation structure by the sounds that the leaves of certain trees uh, produce, or of course you hear you get some information about biodiversity uh, by the many different sounds that animals produce in a particular area. Um, you hear maybe also something about human land use uh, by the sounds of cattle in a certain area, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's in an audio recording of a landscape or of a soundscape, there's a lot of ecological information and relations. And of course, that's always a little bit a problem, especially for natural scientists that try to focus on certain phenomena. It's the very holistic uh, way of looking to an ecosystem because in an audio recording, there's always everything that is present in a particular soundscape. So you've somehow forced to investigate the the, the sum of relationships. So that's something that you see here in, in that graph. So um, sound, the sound sources that have a certain influence on each other. And there we start with classifications also. And there are three like basic uh, classifications called geophonies, biophonies, and anthropophonies. And you see already with the flashes here, they have certain stronger or less stronger influences on each other. In particular, these are the anthropophonies that have an in still increasing uh, impact on the biophonies, the sounds that, for instance, animals produce in a particular landscape. So we look at these relationships, and if you look at um, acoustic or soundscape ec ecology in general, it's a very uh, multidisciplinary field of, uh, of research. So other disciplines come here on board and actually that changes with every project you start. You get different, uh, not only different uh, scientific disciplines involved, but also very different stakeholders that live in the area or have to do with what you try to investigate. So that varies from spatial ec ecology to psychoacoustics. Acoustic ecology as the traditional field of our research and of course, bioacoustics, which is almost the historical form of uh, uh, investigating sound produced by animals. So first, the first scientists that start to work with sound were the bioacousticians that try to read up um, behavior of animals by their acoustical expressions. Yeah, so uh, one example and maybe the biggest project I did until now was Sounding Soil, it's a so-called Sounding Soil project. And it started here also in Wolle and that's Meadow. Um, I was just like uh, finishing a research project where we were listening to the sounds that trees produce, especially sounds that are produced in the course of drought stressing trees. And we developed a special sensor that was a piezo element that had a needle uh, soldered on it. And we stick the needle into the bark to be able to listen to, to the physiological sounds of the trees. And I had all the equipment with me, it was in holidays here somewhere in the Alps, close by uh, Finwald. And out of curiosity, I was just sticking one of the sensors into the soil. So sounds of a meadow, your maybe especially the people that are working here since a longer time, like Domendro and Josep, they know how a meadow sounds in the Alps. That's the sound of it. Will it comes or not? 
now there's no sound. Mm -hmm. It's very low. Uh, so you hear the grasshoppers. You hear the traffic down in the valley. And you hear the wind blowing into the grass. So that's the sound we know how it does sound. But how does it does it sound on the ground? Sounds like that. Oh. Hold on. So um, can imagine that I was staying in that meadow for days and just listening to what I heard to these completely unfamiliar sounds. And what you hear actually in that recording is not only the movements of the animals living in the soil or feeding noises, it's even communication, acoustic communication. And that was really fascinating me because I never imagined that there's so much sound in the soil and so much different communication sounds uh, produced by the many different animals living there in the soil. So um, I came back to Zurich and uh, one, two weeks later, it was um, uh, somebody from the NGO Biovision that contacted me and asked, well, I know about your project with the trees. Do you think it would be possible to do the same with soil? And I just said, yeah, that's what I did just some days ago. And it's really fascinating. So we went to the researchers, the entomologists to, uh, at WS and asked them, could you tell us what we hear? We know that must be animals. They produce some kind of vibrational sound or stridulations, which were, I think are related to sounds that insects produce normally, but they hadn't any idea. So, and that, that's still the reason why everyone is highly engaged in that project because that's a complete new field also in acoustic ecology or in bioacoustics. It's barely explored because nobody starts to investigate the soil acoustically. So that's really the, the thing that drives everyone involved into our project until now to investigate that almost unknown kingdom of uh, soil acoustics. And some, some time later, an official research uh, proposal was submitted to the Swiss National Science Foundation and was uh, accepted. And we started our research project, which became uh, a, a bigger project, which is a cooperation now of six different institutions. And uh, what we did in the first course was um, we wanted to know after that basic experience in that old meadow, okay, now we know how a meadow sounds, but how about other soils? Is um, Do they sound differently? Do different soil types sound differently? Is there an influence of humans that we can hear in soil, et cetera, et cetera. So what we did in the first course was uh, we tried to make as many recordings as possible in many different soils here in the forest soil, for instance, um, uh, and everywhere where we made a recording, we took also a sample from the soil to be able to identify the animals that we hear. So the, the, the sample was brought to the lab, the animals extracted from the, from the sample, and the, the species identified and the uh, individuals counted. So that we became an idea of uh, what we were hearing in the different soils. So also here, 
you see we, we've been in arable land, we've been in the mountains, in forests, and also grasslands. And the astonishing thing was, and here comes quite the scientific graph, but uh, the astonishing thing is that little, yeah, is that little red square. There was something uh, we realized once we started to do recordings in arable land, especially intensively used and managed uh, arable land. So um, it was almost quite there. If you went like to a corn acre or similar, similar plantations, it was almost quite in the soil. And uh, when once we started to analyze the, the animals that we had in the in the samplings, and especially compare that with um, uh, acoustical measurements, so you see here there's something called acoustic complexity index, and that's an index that you calculate out of your acoustic recordings, and it tells you something about the acoustic diversity in a recording, and the acoustic diversity is reflecting biodiversity. So if you look to that little square here in that graph, it's the biodiversity is lowest in arable, intensively managed arable land. It's highest in extensively managed grassland. So that's again, the old meadow from the first recording. And it's a bit less in the uh, intensively managed grassland and a bit more or less in, in forests. And forests, they are just a bit different because the soil is different. That means you have a much thicker uh, organic layer in grassland soils than in the forest, for instance. And that's the reason why you hear more animals in grassland than in forests, in forest soils. So that's not really human impact. Human impact, the difference you see mainly here with these two elements in the graph. Uh, graph. So that was also something new to us that we saw an effect of uh, or a human impact in our recordings. And that's still a topic we try to investigate in our research. Now, how to make art out of that? And one of the answers was this um, container here that we showed for the first time at Centrum Paul Klee in Bern. Um, it's a sound installation. And what you see here on the roof of the container is a little garden. And in that garden, there are sensors. They go to the weather station, which is also mounted on the roof. And the weather station sends the measurement data of the soil microclimate to a computer, which produces music with that microclimate. And that's what you hear inside the container. So there's a surround speaker system where you hear actually a sonification of the microclimate of the soil on the rooftop, but only if you don't interact with the console. So there's a console inside the container and there's a sound map. And you see all these points there. These are the points where we made recordings in Switzerland. You could just touch the points and hear the recordings. And you see some smaller points and these are recordings that have, have been made by people participating in our citizen science project. So what you can do still now is you can borrow soil recorders from us and do recordings of your own soil. And the idea is not so much to have the recordings of all the participating people and analyze them. The idea is much more the question, how can hearing the soil be used as a sensibilization method to, for, for soil ecosystems? So people have to answer a questionnaire before they hear their soils and after. So that's the, the scientific part. But at the same time, it's um, also an art installation where the audience becomes part of it. And that's pretty much a topic that uh, spans over a bigger part of my artistic work so that the visitors become observers. So what I try to build with pretty much of my sound installations is something like a public observation system where the visitors became scientists themselves. And it often happens that they hear or see things that we weren't realizing during the research process. The process. So um, it's for me also an important part of my own research as well as future developments uh, of my artworks. So after that first period, um, there were some new questions, of course, also coming out of the discussions with the audience here in the container. And you have to imagine all the recordings that we made here in the console, they were very punctual. That means we went somewhere, made a 15 minute recording and turned back, analyzed the recording. And that's at one hand, 
not very scientific because you need repetitions to say really something about soils and their, so, and their health state. At the other hand, um, new questions arose like, yeah, but uh, how about the temporal or spatial dynamics in soil? Does the sound of soils change over time and place? So that led us again back to Volet, back to Pienwald. We installed a measurement system where we did not only recordings in the soil. So as you see here, the soil microphone, it's with the same tree microphone, but with a longer needle that is been used as an antenna in the soil to catch up the sound waves of the soil animals. But we had also microclimate sensors like uh, soil water potential and uh, temperature, surface temperature, uh, uh, light intensity, et cetera, et cetera, to get an idea of the context of the sound that is uh, evolving in, in the soil. That means, the question was, is that sound somehow related to the microclimatic conditions, for example? And that system stayed for two years in the forest. So we have like two growing seasons Full, fully recorded, that we analyzed then for uh, scientific publication. And the most astonishing that we saw were these two colored graphs here. They are so-called heat maps, and that means they show, um, again, the acoustic complexity index. That means something like biodiversity or activity in uh, the soil there and over uh, large amounts of time. So you see here actually almost two years uh, at, the, at this axis and you see the daytime at the horizontal axis and what you see here are this yellowish pattern in the pink and yellowish means the acoustic complexity is higher. So there are moments, there seem to be moments at daytime where the acoustic complexity gets higher or the biodiversity gets higher. And if you look at winter, it seems to disappear. And uh, a further analysis showed that that's closely related to the microclimatic dynamics in the soil. That means once in the morning, the sun starts to shine on the soil, it heats up and the animals become active. And that's only happening for a certain amount of time during daytime because at a certain point, it gets too warm and too dry and the animals wander down and you won't hear them anymore. And that's the reason for these patterns actually. So the activity in the soil is closely related to the microclimatic conditions. That's for the scientific part, but of course I'm always seeking for uh, uh, production of new artistic works out of that scientific data. And that led me to um, another place in the Swiss Alps. It's in Graubünden, but quite far away from here. It's in the Italian part, Italian speaking part, very in the south of Graubünden at the uh, Galanka Valley. And the question there was, how would that be uh, if I do several recordings and you see here the points on that Google map, that's all points where I did soil recordings. How would they be different in a very small area? And one thing you have to know about alpine ecosystems is that they are extremely diverse uh, related to the exposition and the altitude. So is a place in the sun or rather in the shadow, is it at a certain height? You have completely different communities of plants and animals. So my expectation was to hear very different things in that small community. And that was really the case. And that led to an installation that looked like this. So what you see here on that table, the table has the shape of that particular community where I took the recordings and there were emitters on the backside of the table that uh, played the recordings back that I made in the landscape. And that's uh, an installation where you cannot only hear the sounds of the soil animals or of the diff different habitats, but you can also touch the table and feel the sounds. So you really get connected to what's happening in, in the soil. And that's a bit, uh, stays a little bit in contradiction to what's actually happening on the human side uh, in that particular community. So that's a so-called catastrophe plan of uh, the same area that is like shaped with the table. And you see uh, the properties are extremely complex. So that means, it, it, that's also a little bit the funny history about that community. People are always fighting with each other because the property structure is so complex and they always have to walk 
over properties of other people. So they're in constant fight about when can you go and cut your grass there because you have to walk over the neighbor's land, et cetera, et cetera. So, and of course, if you would listen to uh, what's happening acoustically in the soil, ecosystems do not, ecosystems do not care about human frontiers or, or borders or properties. So the borders of ecosystems are much more fluent and actually in, 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 in constant transformation. So this is a very different kind of geography than normally, is, normally humans produce with uh, this kind of property or this kind of land use as well. That's the thing I wanted to show. Now, um, maybe back to um, the three recordings that we made at Fienwald before the Sanding Soil project started. And there was also the first bigger project I did uh, in Wolle. You see here our sensor where we recorded directly the physiological sounds of plants. And that's also a very fascinating um, soundscape, if you want to say, because you don't, of course, you won't only hear the physiological sounds of trees, but uh, you hear the environment, you hear the inhabitants, animals that live in and on the tree, be it bark beetles or birds, for instance. You hear uh, the changing weather, the wind blowing into the branches and needles. So again, it's a very holistic view on the life of a particular tree. So if we talk about the physiological sounds of a tree, it sounds like this. So basically you have like two different kinds of sound, sounds. One is this constant crackling and that's what we call sap flow. And of course, it's not really the water that you hear moving into the water leading, in the water leading tissue, but what you hear is our gas bubbles that move with the water in the water leading vessels. So once they change from cell to cell, they produce a crackling sound. And then you hear the louder clicks. These are these signals that go over the whole bandwidth of this spectrum or acoustic spectrum. And these are the so-called cavitation pulses. These signals occur when there is drought stress in the plant. And drought stress means the plant, the tree is transpirating, so losing water through its uh, openings in the needles or, or uh, leaves. Uh, that's happening every day when the sun shines on, on a plant, on a tree, and it's how photosynthesis norm normally happens. So uh, the tree transpirates water and takes CO2 in, and that only really works good when there is enough water in the soil, when there is enough water being taken up by the roots. And once there is a lack of water in the soil, the tension gets higher and higher in the transpiration until the water column collapses and that produces a loud click over the whole spectrum. And these are the, the particular sounds that we were investigating because that's also something we didn't realize at the beginning of our research project at Wolle. We just wanted to investigate sounds of trees and see how different they could be. And at a certain moment we realized uh, okay, if the loudest sounds uh, occur during drought stress, that's also something how we could show artistically how climate change impacts the life of plants. So how plants try to cope with uh, drought periods. So something abstract like climate change became immediately graspable by uh, this acoustic representation. And of course, you can also have a scientific look on this uh, phenomena of drought stress sounds. So you see here the water potential in the soils. We, have, we had like two trees completely wired. One was down in the valley and one was uh, on the rock plate uh, above Fienwald. 
And uh, as soon in later spring, the drought stress uh, started with uh, uh, decreasing soil water potential. You had these cavitation sounds. Yeah. And the interesting thing is, it was much more in a tree that was like closely connected to the groundwater system close to the river down in the valley than in the tree, which was growing on a very hot rock plate and was, of course, adapted to, to drought much better than the one that had normally had enough water and was experiencing the drought stress. And the interesting thing is also later this period became even, even, even uh, more difficult but there weren't any sig signals anymore. So you could also show acoustically how trees adapt to that situation by more or less stopping the production and the transpiration. They close the stomata, the openings on the needles and leaves and don't do anything anymore when it gets too dry. And of course, that's something you can hear. And the idea was also to show that in a, a sound installation, there are different versions of it. That's the bigger version. In the, in the immersive environment where you sit like in a bird's house in a tree, we had also cameras on the tree, a panoramic camera system. And once you touch the branches, you could hear the sounds of the plants. So you get like physically connected to what's happening acoustically in, in the plant. There was also a smaller version that has been presented also at Kunsthaus, the Earthbeats exhibition that Katrin uh, told about. So, same with these panoramic uh, time-lapse movies. And that's an important thing also, once you start to work artistically with this kind of scientific data coming out of ecosystems. Um, trees, for instance, they live in a completely different time domain as we do. Much of the processes are much slower. So for making them perceptible by uh, with an artistic work or for, uh, for a certain audience, you have to speed up things. So what we normally do is something like an acoustic time-lapse, often also combined with video time-lapse to, to make this phenomenon really graspable. Acoustic time-lapse means that, and that's also the thing I do here at Oklatobel, um, you have a so-called audio logger. That means you place a recorder in a landscape that is programmed to do recordings in intervals. So for instance, here at Oklatobel, I tell the recorder, do a recording every hour for one minute. And then you like sum up these recordings and mount them together and you have something like an acoustic time lapse. So you hear changes in the soundscape much, much faster than you than when you would be outdoors and just listening. And that's an important thing. So, and I think that's maybe also the possibility of art or media art to uh, make things graspable you won't hear when you're outdoors. And that's also the meaning of it because Otherwise, I always say, if you just want to experience a forest, you have to go outdoors and be in the forest. So here's something shown that won't be possible to show in, uh, possible to be, won't be possible to experience outdoors. Am I still already too late? <laughs> okay. Yeah, so what we do now is I show you a short video of that installation, how the sounds work together. What you see and hear is something I tried to comment live. Um, it's just an excerpt of this uh, sound installation. And then I think we will skip the bigger installation because that's also something you can check online. So what you hear are like two days and it starts at night time. So, and there are a lot of non-natural sounds, synthetic sounds. So this, woo, 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 this that's a synthetic sound that represents air humidity measurements. And you will hear in that recording once it's early in the morning, the humidity, the air humidity increases and the, the sound, the pitch of the sound gets higher because it's data sonification. That means measurement data is used to control sound. Now here it gets higher and higher, slightly higher. And you hear this low rumbling sound. That's the sound of the soil water potential. It goes for the soil water potential too. And then it gets day. And this ferric sound is the sound of the daylight, the intensity of the daylight. There comes a string sound in, that's the sound of the solar energy coming on the tree 
falling over the tree. And then you hear the recordings from the back, the cracking sounds of the plant itself. So the transpiration and water transit starts. As, as closer that we come to the middle of the day to noon, this drought stress clicks start to increase. So we really hear how this really is getting stressed by a drought. Now it starts. The longer a drought period uh, lasts, the more the sounds uh, last into the late afternoon or evening or even night. Until a certain point, the tree quasi decides to stop the production and transpiration and waits until the conditions get better. Yes, this is it, and maybe you we'll have some questions. <laughs> I am very inspired by the intersections of, uh, you know, of, of data, of the science that you bring in, and the kind of aesthetic um, packaging of, of these projects, right? There was so much that uh, if you are doing that, it's quite often it was very, very much based on visualization. So you rely on the, you know, on the on the, um, on the sense of a vision, right? You've got this beautiful project, Touch the Table, which, which introduced you know, the sense of touch as well. And I'm very interested for you know, there are also possibilities um, uh, kind of, of engaging the matters in Soviet, whether this is, you know, classically kind of taste perception or, mm -hmm. um, yeah, smell or what have you, you know, other just. Yeah, the matters and so on, other um other senses. I was thinking about exclusively about smell, smell, taste, touch, mm -hmm. but at least these are you know some kind of or, or, or not um you know projects, some kind of potentialities in the projects as well. Mm -hmm. Becomes more and more important. So I think when I think back in the last years, I mainly did sound installations. And the visual or also haptic becomes more and more important because you can show their different aspects. And that's maybe also something we could do today, probably in the evening, that we do a little tour in the exhibition at Alpenblick, because also here at Aqua Total, I do not only explore the area by acoustical means, but also uh, regarding their visual qualities or visual topographies, or in the particular case of the exhibition or the works that you see there in the hotel, uh, the surface structure or textures that I find in this uh, particular alpine ecosystem. But uh, at the other hand, there was a, that's something you really have to check out. There was a very beautiful work of, uh, we did a bigger project at Feenwald where we investigated the whole forest. Uh, more artists also than me, there were two other artists. And uh, Rosa Smitte, a, a Latvian artist, she investigated uh, basically the uh, uh, olfactory uh, appearance of the forest because in a pine forest you really it smells strong it smells strong and it, it starts to uh, smell stronger and stronger with climate change because there's much more resin being evaporated by the by the trees and she visualized that smell uh, by uh, lighters uh, lighter videos so that means laser scannings of the trees and animations of this uh, Racing particles leaving the tree. So, and that was a really beautiful project because we had three completely different perspectives on the forest. Thank you. Thank you. A question about mapping, and especially with the maps. And the video that you showed us, we hear sounds that you have to map the sounds to. And which is actually data that we are able to be heard. And, and there is actually asking you how 
for whom do you do it? Is it for an artistic program to have a audience or and then I have ask my question about the, the aesthetic or is it for actually scientists who have a novel version into their data? I would say it's like two different uh, contexts or levels I try to interact or to produce uh, works or also do my research. So one important aspect is the, the, the non-scientific public and that's also the reason why most of the sounds that you hear in that video have this ambient immersive touch so that people really immerse into this uh, generative constantly playing music and see with time, with time they, they maybe start to hear patterns and relationships without having any scientific knowledge. And that's a pretty important thing in my work. The other is more in the scientific context where I try to develop or at least inspire other scientists to use other methods. So, uh, and there's a constant question also for me, how much you could use artistic methods or how much artistic methods can because can become scientific methods. Uh, do, do your scientist colleagues sit down and listen to these things? Of course, yeah. So they do. <laughs> they do, they do. Especially the partners I'm working with, we listen a lot and discuss about what we hear and how this can be related to their, their measurements. And most of the projects we do they do their measurements at the same time as I do. So what you hear as sonifications in the video is all measurement data uh, from an ecophysiologist of WSL. So he measured uh, the microclimate, the changes in the stem radius, et cetera, et cetera. And there, of course, we discussed a lot, especially how we design these sounds. So what should be, how could air humidity sound like? Or what would be the sound of sunlight? And that was maybe the most fun in the project to develop this particular uh, kind of sounds together. And then not to forget, it's also a very important topic and that's something we talk tomorrow about uh, when we talk about Oplotobel. It's not only me and other scientists working in projects. There are many other stakeholders like local foresters, the people living in a certain area that point you to certain phenomena. So, most of my works, they come out of a discourse about landscape and the things you meet there. And of course, the experts are the people that are, are living and working there. So they're always part of the development of my works. I have a more scientific question. Uh, in your diagrams, it was about complexity. Uh, do you work also with the recognition, like voice recognition, but also like uh, computer programs that will tell you this sound is this being or this sound is that being? Mm -hmm. Or is it mostly about the complexity that is the indicator? Or is it also identified that this sound is from that bug or this one makes that sound? Yeah. Now, especially in the sounding soil project, we only worked on till now statistically. That means we just looked at the many different sounds representing many different animals. But that changed, especially in my uh, fellowship at Freie Universität Berlin, where we start to try to recognize single species automatically with a computer. So to train the computer with machine learning to identify single species. That's one of the projects I'm um, doing there. Thank you so much, Marcus. I think we have to wrap up, but it was very, very stimulating. I think, you know, uh, well, another question would be to ask about the limitation of technology as well. You know, what are we not hearing for that? It will be good for the future. Um, joining, thank you, Marcus. Thank you.